Today, we have this open symposium on neuroscience, and we are very pleased to welcome three professors uh, to join us. Later, I'll leave uh, Professor Louis from NIE, who's our moderator, to introduce our three professors. Right? But before that, uh, I know today is a very exciting day. Uh, it's the 8th of November. So there's a lot of uh, red and blue... Uh, uh, nine, sorry, 9th of... Uh, now, now you know which date I am at. Uh, I, my, my time is in the US time, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's the 9th of November in Singapore and the 8th of November in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of red and blue, uh, but yeah, we are, well, less about that. Okay. So, before we start, uh, just, uh, just to share this important notice, that this event will be recorded via photography and videography, right? Images and oh, sorry, images and videos would be shared on the websites on OER. If you do not wish to be photographed or video recorded, please approach any OER persons in charge. Uh, just just let them know, right? Okay. And uh, without ado, uh, further ado, may I invite uh, Dr. Louis to share uh, to introduce our three professors. So. Uh a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's very ominous, right? Whenever I, I had an education event, there's some, uh, it's a US election vote counting. <laughs> I remember uh, we ran the International Conference on Learning Sciences in June and they, they, they had a Brexit vote. And, uh, <laughs> so it seems very ominous for educational events. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, my name is Chi Kit. I, uh, I'm with the Learning Sciences Lab at NIE. So uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this uh, symposium. So my, my job is to basically introduce the speakers and then to facilitate some discussion after their talks. So uh, I think uh, today's symposium uh, on uh, educational neuroscience is application, impact, and implications in the classroom. I think it's very, the topic is very timely and appropriate. So I work in the field of the learning sciences as you know, it's an interdisciplinary field of study that draws on theories and research from various disciplines, so such as uh, instructional design, educational technology, uh, educational psychology, design studies, information studies, cognitive science, you know, developmental science, and many more. And more recently, the neurosciences. So, uh, so I've been studying as educator, edu educational researchers. We've been studying. Uh, learning phenomena, educational phenomena at the level of the individual learner, you know, the social learner, learning in groups, at the class level, at the community level, and even at the social level, for example, the World Wide Web. So uh, in cognitive science, for example, we have uh, mental models of the learners. Now with the advent of neuroscience, uh, we, have, we have our opportunities to look inside the brain and look at the neuronal level. So the question, the big question is, uh, can we have an even more powerful science of learning? So uh, we have now more data to, for researchers like us to piece together evidence to form a more composite picture, a more holistic picture of how people learn and how people learn in different contexts. So we can learn you know, at different ages, individually or together, with or without support of a teacher and different cultures. So. Uh, we're just very intrigued by the field of neuroscience, you know, how can we paint a more holistic picture of learning? If you are a practitioner, I guess you may be interested, you know, whether and how this new science of learning, now they can look inside the brain, can help us to understand and predict, you know, what, perhaps what innovative pedagogies can work under what context. So, uh, it's not often there are three very distinguished neuroscience professors here. So, uh, <laughs> We have them here to talk about the potentials and possibilities of neuroscience. So uh, the way the symposium is structured, each of them will have uh, half an hour to, you know, to share with you, and then later we will come back together and we have some discussion. I think we may have a lot of burning questions on neuroscience to ask them. So uh, let me first introduce the uh, our first speaker. That's uh, Professor. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> Professor Sang Yi Kim. He's a professor of educational psychology and the director of Brain and Motivation Research Institute at Korea University. So his research interests revolve around 
interdisciplinary approach to interest and motivation, including neuro educational approaches on interest and motivation, motivational adaptive uh, tutoring agents, and interest based learning models. So, I think these are, these are very topics which will be interesting interest and motivation. So, he, he He's, he received the Distinguished Teaching Awards 12 consecutive times from Korea University. So he's a very good speaker. <laughs> the Edwin Newman Award for Excellence in Research from the American Psychological Association. An award for Outstanding Contribution from Korea Educational Psychology Association. So uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome uh, Professor Kim. Yeah. Thank you for a nice introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I'm Song Yeo Kim from Korea University in BMRI, as you can see, Brain and Motivation Research Institute. I'm going to share the, some of my research I have done uh, on the student motivation and, and interest today. Uh, do you think whether they are going to school or going home? <laughs> going home? How oh, sure? Why? What makes you think so? Happy. Are you pro teachers or uh, professionals in educational institutions? As this is my lifetime goal to let the kids go to school with a smile. But this is uh, the reality <laughs> in school. Where is David? Yeah, this is for you, okay? He just got from uh, Korea and he tried to sleep during my talk, so I. <laughs> So, yeah, this is reality. We would like to uh, do something. Uh, we need to change the classroom environment. Why do you think they are slipping in the classroom? Why? Why, why, why they, their brain is not engaging? There are several reasons, right? Too difficult, too easy. Too boring, I must be tired, and they did a lot of other things uh, last night. So there are several other uh, important reasons for their sleep. But still, uh, we need to design the learning environment more the fun and exciting. What are you going to do this weekend? You select one of those activities, then people will say you are motivated to do that. So might be you watching the ball game or party, or exercise and studying and helping other people or sleep. Whatever you choose, your action is selected by your agency. So when I observe your behavior, I think you are highly motivated to do that particular activity. Right? If you persist these things every weekend, we still think he is highly intrinsically motivated in that particular activity. Traditional model of motivation actually assumes this is kind of energy reservoir, and then there is some valve, so we select act one, two, three, four, or so. So one of those act, and then we spend more energies in doing that. So direction and energy is the motivation of things. So you might be familiar with those traditional psychological theories of motivation people are doing when they reinforce, uh, when they attribute to themselves a high competence and autonomy and self-relation, uh, social relations and expectancy value and high mastery goals and interest self -regulation. All these things are actually tapping some part of the human motivation, not the whole dynamic processes. And there are serious problems in this uh, traditional psychological theories of motivation. Um, the grand theory is, is needed, measurement problems, uh, the set report has some problems, and uh, also the less practical implication. So I, I organized those uh, sources of motivation into three different things. I will talk about pleasure, I will talk about utility value, I will talk of a goal. Keep these three in your mind. These three things you education people need to pursue. Okay? Let the students have pleasure. Let the students have value. Let the students have goals. So these three motivation has three separate neurological pathways. 
One is approach reward driven pathways. The other is decision making pathways. The other one is goal directed control regulation pathways. So this is my personal model. I personally think uh, motivation is value based decision making processes. You choose one act, one stimuli, one person over the other one based on those values. So whether it gives me pleasure, whether it is useful, whether it is related to my personal ultimate goals or what the proximal goals. So how much I like it, how much students like it, how much students need it, how much students should do it. Those kind of three components are the component of value. On the other hand, there is cost. How much time and effort I need to spend to achieve that particular goal, right? So if it's too much, too much effort needed, too much time is needed, it's costly. So that cost-benefit analysis it turns into the avoidance if those cost is high. If those value is high, the approach behavior. I'm going to spend my time in doing mass homework or not watching TV, depending on cost-benefit analysis. A lot of fun things happen in television. I, the value on television is high. The homework is needless, it's repetitious drills, the cost is high. So watching TV versus doing homework, the cost of benefit analysis, just watching TV, avoiding homework. So whole decision making process has neural uh, the foundation. So let's talk about the value. Uh, value is subject to judgment on the desirability and signal for decision making and it has, it's, it's called the neuronal currency. So neuron uh, transmits the, the, those signals as value. <laughs> Three types of values, hedonic value, like pleasure, we would, center. And the, the other one is utility value, it's social and cognitive value is all utility value and goals. Goal is the same as value, but uh, salient working value is called goals. So the goal is more future-oriented value, but these are the current, uh, the usefulness. And those are three different pathways, pledge pathways based on those ventral striatum, and then those utility is based on orbital frontal. And just right behind your eyes, there is a huge area. It's called orbital frontal area. This is decision making area, especially for value. And third one is goal directed brain area, dorsal lateral, very the outside and uh, the lateral part. And this is related to working memory and executive function. And the reward, this is ventral striatum and go to the anterior cingulate and the primate areas. Whole pathways are reward circuit. And as you can see, if you see the ladies, you see the, the, the backs activate your pleasure center and the males for sports car, the money, drug, uh, meditation, <coughs> and uh, good looking, and babies, helping other people, uh, the empathy, praise, the love, all. Especially this artwork, uh, this is evolutionary strange thing, this music and uh, the paintings activate pleasure center too. But anyhow, the common things, they are activating the pleasure center deep inside of your limbic system. So dopamine is released when you see this, when you do this, right? So if students need to uh, have a certain pleasure, well, we cannot provide all these things, right? Probably some of this, mainly this social interaction environment, right? So this is dopamine pathway from deep inside to the prefrontal areas. And the, this hedonic value also has three different uh, types, uh, sensory and cognitive pleasure. This is curiosity. I'm, I'm working on this stuff, the curiosity. It's not a pleasure. The curiosity itself is discomfort, but the resolution of curiosity, the end of curiosity, that's the satisfaction, that's pleasure. And social pleasure, social uh, relation and support is another uh, sources of pleasure. So those experiences, if kids can experience these pleasures in school, I think that's that's good uh, environment. And Actually, I ran one of the experiments uh, doing these different reward contingencies. This is monetary incentive. When they succeed in this artificial task, they receive this money. Uh, if they fail, they don't lose anything. But this lose condition, if they succeed, they wouldn't get 
anything, but if they fail, they lose something. The reason I compare these two contingencies, in school setting, teacher use penalties, right? If you do undesirable behavior, I will give you the minus point to take off one point, right? That contingency. Or the other way, the gain contingency is giving the bonus or giving the stickers or the uh, extra point. So these two conditions I want to compare, and the combined is most people use those coupons versus penalties. So those three uh, contingencies were compared in the scanner. Uh, and what I found is positive feedback, the gain condition. So whenever they succeed, they win the money. That this pleasure center, uh, satisfaction area is activated high, higher than the other two. And when they receive negative feedback, this satisfaction area is deactivated, those two. And then amygdala is also uh, deactivated. So these, well, um, so in some, uh, I think those contingency actually activated different brain, uh, the activation pattern and the gain condition uh, have um, more advantage. And novel things, uh, this morning I had a, the discussion with officers and, and practitioners, and then they wondering the, how much effect of the uh, drill and practice is. Uh, every education is practicing drills, but that's a killer in terms of motivation. Drill and practice demotivates uh, always, okay? But we need, uh, in order to get the expertise, we need to practice and drill uh, in a novel way, okay? Not the same way, in a novel context and in a novel learning, with lo novel learning material, with novel uh, the activity, they need to practice. So novelty itself actually activate this satisfaction area. So if you see something, something novel or with the novel findings or novel stimuli in classroom, your satisfaction increased, right? So the, we need to make every, the learning material or situation context uh, more novel. And the curiosity, as I mentioned, that this is attention and then I feel some gap between the information and this is the discomfort, arousal, high arousal. What is the, how I'm, I'm going to uh, explore the, the bridge, those gaps, and then explore things as the prefrontal is used. And if it is resolved, it, it gives pleasure. If it is not resolved, uh, this, this gap, uh, the loop is doing again. So uncertainty, discomfort uh, is, 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 is necessary before they get into those satisfactions. So kids always need to have certain gap between what teacher said and actually the, what the text says. They fill some gaps, and then they try to infer, explore through the collaboration or inquiry, or whatever, so that those curiosity, discomfort should be maintained for a while. And then finally, with the help of teachers or peers or some uh, the technology, they can resolve this curiosity. That's the, the better satisfaction loop. And these are neuroimaging studies showing whenever they show the trivia questions and then answer was given, that satisfaction area is activated. And cooperation and competition, I, that, I ran this experiment. Uh, this is kind of a computer game uh, in the scanner. The purpose is the, you doing by yourself and uh, cooperating, helping other people to choose the right answer and competing other people with this thing. So helping uh, versus competing, and then their brain activation shows when they helping other people, this satisfaction related area, the value area is activated. That means uh, we, uh, in some way, will born uh, uh, in altruistic, uh, as an altruistic person. So help, when helping other people, I feel satisfaction too. So collaboration might be quite important in those pleasure. And this is quite old experiment, all the millennial brain stimulation experiment. The, the, this red, the electrode was implemented in the, those pleasure center, nearby those pleasure center areas. And then what the, this red did is press the button, okay? All the time, so until he exhausted. Pressed on, over food, he didn't eat the food, he, he didn't mate, just press the button because the electrodes is related to that button. The electrical stimulation um, makes it more feel pleasure. 
So do you think this rat actually satisfied with those electro electrical stimulation? We don't know. We cannot interview with rats. We, can, we cannot ask. Rat cannot self-report. So later, people found this facial expression of animal have the same evolutionary root. So th this mouse expression actually tells whether it feels pleasure or displeasure. So this is the kind of hedonic expression uh, as sweet things and tongue is inside. Then they try to take something in. But the aversive reaction is they open their mouths and they vomit and take the, out those poisons. So this is uh, uh, the aversive mouse reactions, and then this is hedonic reaction. When they actually look at uh, this mouse's facial expression, it was this, aversive reaction. <laughs> that means kids hate to press the button, but he cannot help stop pressing. So he pr continuously press. That means he didn't like it, but he did it. This, this experiment is uh, not experiment. This research actually shows there are two distinct center in the pleasure nearby the dopamine released area. It's the wanting area and liking area. We commonsensically think wanting is highly correlated with liking. I want it because I like it. No, brain has separate distinct pathways. So even if you like it, you don't want it. You don't do it again. Okay? The other way around is also true. If you really um, don't want it, but you may like it. Right? So they, they uh, did the animal experiment with uh, dopamine uh, release. So they blocked actually dopamine release. They showed the liking without wanting. And then they the, the injected the dopamine agonist that they found one thing without liking. So one thing, there is not a commonsensical uh, meaning. One thing is just approaching over and over continuously. So addiction is the best example of one thing. Addicted people who dr taking drugs, they are not satisfying with those drugs. They just cannot help. If they stop, uh, it's a killing pain. But uh, they don't like it at all. So. In the sense, those dopamine uh, release in the school setting, we, we can think of how the students like it or they actually they want it. Uh, and well, I, I can skip addiction as those things, and then their brains are highly different. The, the computer addicts is a serious problem in Korea during, uh, among the adolescents. Their brain is changes, so the computer the addict can be diagnosed as another addiction behavioral addicts, so control group, the uh, dopamine area is quite active, but uh, this cocaine users brain uh, activation, dopamine receptor is less activated. And another pathway is value, it's called uh, orbitofrontal area. This is value-based decision-making area. So value is formed, and then that is compared with other value, and then that value is updated through the outcome and feedback. So, for example, your conditioning, you have a certain value about the color, about the food, or about your previous experience. Everybody have coded your, the value of each activity and stimuli. And then that is stored in these areas, okay? And then this is the, the anatomical area of the frontal area. And then, you famous uh, gay, are you familiar with this guy? Yeah, who had uh, the railroad worker in the United States in the early 90s, something, or late 80s. He had uh, iron rod had hit his brain, and then he, this is iron, actually. And then the broke his head, but he was alive. He perfectly normal in cognitive functioning, but only changing is his behavior. He is quite distant people, and he changes into the, uh, the aggressive and violent and capricious, and his personality has changed. So people think this area might be the orbital frontal area, and the orbital frontal area is the area for inhibition. So he cannot inhibit his prof 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 profane behavior. 
but this is not an inhibitory area. This is the value area. So he cannot decide whether uh, his, the consequences of, of his profane behavior. So if the value is not stored, or value is not coded in that particular area, you cannot make a right decision. So uh, yeah, if I uh, say very the violent behavior, the consequences might be bad. So th those kind of value can be predicted based on those areas. So this uh, of the frontal area is coding the value, the pledge of the value. And uh, you want to receive $20 today or what? $30 after two weeks? Which one you choose? This one? <laughs> you don't trust me? Uh, well, this is much better, the calculation, right? Whenever you decide between those two, this is called uh, economics, uh, economics delay discounting or temporal discounting. So everybody discounts the time. So the longer time is the less uh, the beneficial thing. When they decide these two options, always this orbitofrontal area is activated. So the frontal also activated when you make the ratings or evaluate how beautiful, how important, how uh, what is that desirable you decide, and then the, the, the OFC area is activated. So it's a decision making area, and I, I did some experiment, and then whenever they were given the choices, this area, this area, OFC. The ACC is attention related things, and then OFC is activated. So the, Decision making requires certain attention and, and then value related coding. So, the reason why I, I'm focusing on this choice is related to autonomy. The, most of the motivation theory says autonomy is a key component of student intelligent motivation. So, give more choices to students. Do you agree? Oh, really? But from my experiment, from my experiment I found Korean students are not. Uh, do not like their autonomy. If I give a lot of choices, uh, they, uh, to, they are reluctant to choose one over the other one. And they uh, told me they want to ask their parents, <laughs> or teachers, or the seniors. So the choice and autonomy is not always uh, beneficial <laughs> in interdependent culture, probably. But anyhow, this choice requires energy. Okay, this brain is activated. If teacher choose something for students or parents choose something for their <laughs> kids, their kids do not use this orbitofrontal area, do not involving in decision making. So their brain development probably not well in terms of uh, the value related decision making. So let them have more chance to decide than have the stronger connections and with the frontal areas, probably. And autonomous choice, first choice, autonomous choice, more satisfaction. And then choice and engagement. Once they choose, this is a kind of memory task. And then once they choose certain task, they tend to show, they tend to show more engagement. So because I chose this, I choose this, they uh, are likely to engage more. So this uh, locus colorius is related uh, adrenaline, so more active engagement cognitively while they are doing an MBAC task. So working memory task, they are more engaged because they choose a topic. Uh, and the value is selected. Uh, I gave the example playing the game and doing the homework, which one they select. They did cost-benefit analysis, so how much I time uh, spend to that uh, boring homework. And if I uh, that homework, I will uh, have uh, praise later. All kind of the cost can be computed, okay? And then they uh, decide. So most of the motivation theorists are focusing on the value aspect, but the reducing the cost is independent thing, is separate thing as the increase in value, okay? So at risk kids or less competent kids are always thinking about these things. Oh, it takes too much time. I can't do this. Uh, I, I'm so anxious. And I, 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 I might uh, fail again. All kind of those negative aspects has greater uh, uh, than the value if I succeed in. So reducing those costs in the classroom is uh, the real uh, the beneficial for the low uh, the competence kids. What I 
found is those values are related to those kind of positive learning outcomes, but costs are related to all the negative outcomes. If you want to focus on those negative learning outcomes and decrease those incidences, rather than focusing on the task, task value, focusing on the cost and the reducing the cost, student perceived, subjective perceived cost, okay? So then procrastination, disorganization, negative effect, and test anxiety in the classroom would be reduced. And one thing, I, there's an interesting task versus control task, the game uh, kind of task. This interesting task actually reduced the effort cost. The same kind of mass, uh, the, the task, but what uh, they found after those interesting tasks is, oh, the effort is less costly than um, those control groups. So that makes the learning activity more interesting and fun. That probably uh, leads to the reduce the effort cost. And value is updated through the network. Uh, the goals, DLPFC, this, this, uh, the outer part of the, your prefrontal area. And goal is the salient working value, that, that's my definition. And goal represented in the hierarchy of structure, long, long-term goals and short-term goals and uh, immediate goals and there is hierarchy structure. And it is related to working memory. Um, these are the, the uh, delay of gratification or two values are conflict, okay, always. And how do they regulate uh, their behaviors? Sometimes the students are really the, fall into those temptations, how to resist those temptations, the same goals. So if you have strong desire, if your students have strong desire to study, or a strong desire, a strong intention to get a high test score, that's not a goal. That's just a desire, okay? In order to be a goal, it should be implemented, implemented in an if-then condition. So if I want to get this type of test score, I do this, I do this. If I spend this time in this work, this work, I will get this, this, this. So it should be specified in a very in a detailed way, that's the goal. So goals should be chained in that way. And then if they succeeded, they if, if feedback. If they failed, they also get the feedback. But that goal is maintained in the working memory. That's why executive function always emphasize those working memory. Here is to get uh, the cartoon, two people, uh, they uh, need to go shopping after work. But this guy, just uh, 9 o'clock, and they forgot at home, oh, I should have done this, okay? So w in the working memory, their temporary goal will not maintain. But this guy, uh, 4.35, retrieving the, their goal, temporary goals, go for shopping. So the working memory capacity means not the physical, the, the storage capacity, it's more like efficiency. How they utilize those working, limited working memory capacity effectively. So people do uh, really success, su successful in the resisting temptations or self-regulation, they hold the working memory. So you think of a marshmallow test, or they will give the better, uh, the greater, the delicious marshmallow later. So if you have to, have to tend that, uh, work, uh, that uh, temporary goals in your know, working memory and uh, in a pri in priority. And then later, the other distractors coming still, you need to retrieve that, uh, the goals. So as long as you maintain goal efficiently, uh, your self-regulation might be uh, successful. And there are a lot of the commercial programs and then educational training programs as working memory training. This is dot and showing briefly and then trying to remember the spaces. And this is very the boring type of training as long time ago as 2004. But their brain activation pattern has been changed through this five week training. So in real classroom, we don't have to do this kind of tedious boring things, but uh, 
through the musical play or, uh, or the physical ac activity, we can do a lot of working memory uh, training. So the new curriculum uh, development based on those working memory training might be helpful. So response inhibition kind of the flank of task also helpful. Um, the summary is uh, the, the motivation is value-based decision making and then pleasure utility goals are highly important in the sense in the classroom and the teacher should value all those three things and remind the student goals and then let them uh, maintain their goals and good habits. The habits is kind of addiction but in a good way they can have total controllability and then autonomous learning environment the goal should be implemented it reduces the cost and self-evaluation uh, self at the feedback, I, I talked about this um, the other day. And executive function training might help to uh, maintain or generating uh, student motivation. Uh, this is neuroeducation, so it's far away to go, but all those uh, the interdisciplinary uh, this, uh, the principles or the findings can be applied or translated or the or, uh, the research uh, with this uh, learning uh, related topics. So I edited one book during my sabbatical this year, so it's going to be published in next month. So if you are interested in the human motivation research uh, in terms of neuroscience, uh, I want to introduce it. Okay, thank you.